Okay, so why don't we start by, we'll start with both of you. And the first question I was going to ask is just to say your full names and when you were born. And I was thinking if you know any history around your names at all, like if you were named after anybody, if you don't, then that's fine. So just start by saying your names and when you were born and where you were born. Okay. You want to go first or shall I go first? I'm yeah. Hazel Madge <laughs> Lundbeck. I was born Hazel Madge Gregory in London in 1924 on the 27th of September. I was, my middle name, I understand, is from uh, my mother's sister and aunt, whom I didn't know particularly well. I was born at six o'clock in the evening, and uh, when just about when the news was coming on, and my father always told me as a child, I was never quiet any other time when it came on. That's all I remember about my actual beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> you might also have added that was the only time you, the only time in your life you were ever on time for anything, too. You came along for the six o'clock news. Well, my name, is, my name is Raymond John Lumbeck. I was born December the 8th, 1921, mm -hmm. uh, in Cardiff in South Wales, Great Britain. Uh, my father was Danish, my mother was Irish, and um, uh, my father was in, the, was in the Danish Merchant Marine and apparently he met my mother when he was on a, on a trip back to, to, um, to Cardiff. I don't know exactly how they met or where they met but you can call it almost an immaculate conception because I was born about a year, a year later. <laughs> That's as far as I go. <laughs> Okay, well, for both of you, I was, what's the, if you think back, what's the very earliest memory that you can remember? Take well, my, a minute and think of the very earliest one. My earliest memory, I, well, I can remember this, even though I was about three or four. We were living in Cardiff in, in, um, in lodgings with a Mrs. Cannon, and they had a son, Alfie Cannon, who was about 10 or 11 years of age, and at Christmas time he received a toy train and I can remember crawling up the stairs to look at this play with this train and dropping the thing at the top of the <laughs> stairs. The whole damn lot went downstairs and broke to pieces. <laughs> that was the first thing I, I remember, very, very clearly. Popular. <laughs> very clearly, I remember that. <laughs> okay, well, we know you. Well, sadly, the earliest thing I remember, and I must have been very young because I was being bathed in a in a tin bath on the te kitchen table and my father, my mother had died by this time, she died when I was two and I really don't remember her and um, my father's sister was living with us who was, who <clears throat> was very good but she was very short tempered and I think the thing I remember most is being <laughs> lifted out of the bath because I was screaming my head off. I wasn't very fond of water and getting a good slap across the back and told, um, if you're really going to cry, you may as well have something to cry for. And, <laughs> that is the, and then she sat down by the fire with me wrapped in a towel and that is my very earliest memory. Very sensible. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I remember, no, I don't remember this. I was told about this. When I was a child, a baby, I used to bawl and bawl and bawl. <laughs> and one time my mother uh, uh, picked me up and threw me on the sofa and said, now cry your damn eyes out. <laughs> and I let, ah, I let forth a yell there that could be heard miles away, miles away. <laughs> Parents had very short tempers in those days. <laughs> okay, so um, mm. why don't you talk about your siblings and how you got on with them? What was your relationship to your siblings? And say who they were, when they, how much, you know, the difference in age, and what was your relationship with them? Well, my sister Joan was born on October the twenty-sixth, uh, three years after, three years after I was born, or four years, four years after I was born. Nineteen twenty-four, the same as me. Twenty-six, she was. No, that's no, right. Twenty-four, twenty-four. Um, she and I, she and I got on very well together. We were, we were always, always good friends. Uh, I remember that there used to be a little horror in my class called Witch Dicky Whittington, Whittington or Windingham, and he used to torment the life out of me by con consistently and continually following me from school. And I remember Joan at one time. Uh, 
went up to him, pu pushed a, f a fist in his face, and said, if you don't eat my brother, I'm going to knock your damn head off. <laughs> or words to that effect. And he stopped doing it. He stopped doing it. <laughs> Your protector. Words the, yes, she was in those days. We've always had a very, very close relationship, though, and um, we love each other very much indeed. Always have done. Um, I had a good relationship with my brother and sister. I had an as elder sister who was 11 years older than myself and, of course, remembered her mother and was uh, mostly very protective to me, more uh, much an elder sister. My brother was four years older than me. I was obviously the youngest in the family. And he and I were very good friends. We tended to think alike. And uh, when um, our parents used to go out, <coughs> we used to have wrestling matches and boxing matches on the uh, carpet in front of the fire. And because, as he explained very carefully to me, that we really couldn't knock each other out, we used to draw cards to see who was going to be the winner. <laughs> and then he used to get mad because I was fairly small at that time. And when we used to wrestle, he, uh, we'd wrestled for a long time. And you know, as you know, you have to pin someone to wrestle. And every time he used to get me within an inch of the floor, I used to wriggle up between his legs because I was small. <laughs> but we had great fun. We, we, we got on pretty well together, pretty well. I remember there was, there was one stage when, I can't remember why, but I hated Joan for some reason or other. I loathed the tester. <laughs> and we, we had frequent f fights. This is when we were children. and. We had a, a, a door leading into the living room with a glass panel, and she says that I threw the kit, a kitten at her, and it lodged in her hair. <laughs> and since then, she had a morbid fear of cats. <laughs> but all I can remember of that is that that I started to chase her, and she slammed the door in my face. I put my hand right through the glass panel, and I got a cut. I've still got the scar of that cut. Here to this day. And I remember telling my father about it and getting a whop over the head for, for being such a bully to my sister. <laughs> so I, I lost them both counts there. That was the usual thing. My, my brother also put his shoulder through the through the glass in the kitchen window. Uh, but he was a he was a terrible tease and uh, Internecine he, warfare. Yeah, he 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 just was such a tease, especially when he got a bit older. And I can remember uh, I think my 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 sister-in-law, my sister slammed the door in his in his face too, and he put um, put his shoulder to it and put the glass out. It didn't please my father very much, mm -hmm. but uh, he was a he was a lot of fun and a great tease. And I can remember when he was older, my he wanted to borrow the money to go to the cinema, and. Uh, my sister said to him, "Moving uh, pictures." Uh, no, you know, um, I'm not going to keep lending you money to go to that. I lent you money last week, and so he started to act up, and he had them, my sister, and my stepmother laughing so much in the end. My stepmother said, "For goodness' sake, lend him the money and get rid of him and let him go to the movies." And my sister said, "You lend him the money. I lent him the money last week." <laughs> But I guess he got to go to the movies because he was he he was quite a cut up <laughs> in those days. Very staid, my brother. Now you wouldn't believe he used to act up like he did. <laughs> um, who was your first best friend? And what were um, they like? And what was that relationship for like? For me, for me, it was uh, Jill, and my friend Jill, who now lives in New Orleans. That was your first best friend. Yes, really. Uh, well, n n no, perhaps. Well, best friend, yes. I mean, I had friends uh, that lived nearby in the street when I was young, the, the two Tucker girls and um, Betty Fletcher and um, another girl, Barton. And we were all close friends. We played all the time together. But we were a group always. You, you asked for a best friend. We. We were a group, we always played together. Our mothers always knew where we were, we would be, where was one, the others were there. But when I got to be 10, uh, 11 actually, when we went to the senior school, then I made two very close friends. One was Jill and one was a girl who lived close by Elsie. And we three were absolutely inseparable for years. But Jill and I went on. Then we we have we are still friends. After I have known her sixty six years, <laughs> close friends. You know. 
Well, the first best friend I remember was a, a fellow called Ginger Belmont. <laughs> and he and I used to wrestle together. And it was, it was almost like that in the William books. We never needed a signal. We'd come out of our, out of our houses see each other across the road, tear across the road and hurl each other at each other <laughs> and just wrestle to the ground there, getting filthy dirty in the process. <laughs> filthy dirty. But that was, that was all that, then, you know, get up, dust ourselves up and then go out to uh, watch a game of cricket or something. And <laughs> always with that, just hurl each other at each other. <laughs> um, what were your favourite candies earlier? Spearmint bounces. What was that? Forty for a penny. <laughs> <laughs> They were little white balls and very strong, strongly flavoured with peppermint. But the thing I liked was because, of course, you got 40 of them. That's, that's really that's all that counts. Yeah, yes, they went on for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> Get a penny worth of those, you were made for My God, you were made for for days. I wasn't supposed to eat candy. I was supposed to have had high blood sugar or something. So they used to give me a penny and always tell me to buy fruit, which, of course, obviously I didn't do. I always bought candy. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> one of our favourites were similar to your father's, only they were called gobstoppers. They were much bigger round balls. <laughs> were, and you got them in your mouth, your jaw was completely wedged. And you sucked them <clears throat> and you kept taking them out, of course, in filthy hands, because they had patterns. And each time you sucked a coat off, there was a different color or a different pattern on it. So they cost it went in and out, which was most unhygienic, but they were very tasty. So they kept going in. and they lasted forever. So you really got your money's worth out of them. We used to go to a little sweet shop near the infant school where I started to go. And they had jars and jars and jars. And you could have a, a penny could be split into Halfpennies, half pennies, and farthings, and they would, they would, they were so good. These people, how they earned a penny, they would weigh out these little bits of candy, or you could get one little bar. They were four for a penny. They would let you have one for a farthing. Three or four of us would go into the shop. We'd be in there fifteen minutes, and perhaps we'd spend two pence between us. <laughs> but they were endlessly patient. I can't believe when I look back at these people how kind they were. To me. I went, and my friends and I were very happy one day because we were. She was going to the to the sweet shop, as we called it. We didn't call it a candy shop. We were going to the local sweet shop, and she had a penny to spend, and I didn't. And as we were going along, we found a penny that a, a tram had run over. It was on the tram lines, and it was a complete U, like that. It was U-shaped. And uh, we asked them if we he could spend it. And they let us. They said, sure, it's still a penny, whatever shape it is. <laughs> I got a penny with some candy. I thought I was really lucky that day. Of course, you got all sorts of varieties of, uh, of sweets in those days. Do you remember licorice root? Oh, yes. Licorice root was a, was, a, was a piece of bark, a, a, tr a tree, a twig from a tree. And you'd get, you'd get about two or three for a penny. And the thing was, you chewed on this it was thing like all chewing day. a lump of wood. It was chewed. Well, of course it was. <laughs> it was. It was a, a root. actual twig. And we used to buy tiger nuts, the little shriveled tiger nuts. Peanuts, shriveled peanuts. No, they weren't peanuts. Well, they, they were, were sweet. No, they were no. much sweeter than that, tiger nuts. I, could, I remember I had a friend recently look them up and he told me what they were. And, uh, don't repeat it. No, I, I, don't, I don't even remember it, but George, George um, uh, researched it for me because he was interested in tiger nuts. And, uh, oh, and you could get also a penneth, you could go to the baker's and for your penny you could buy a penneth of Bokum biscuits. And they used to display all the beautiful fancy biscuits in boxes with glass tops all along the, all along the counters, you know. Do you remember that? You don't remember? And uh, <clears throat> when the when the uh, cat, uh, tins were finished, they would have broken ones. And you go in and get a pen of broken biscuits, and you got a great big baker's bag like that, stuffed full. They could just turn the corners. We used to eat those going to school. Whereas the same thing too, we used to get two and a half pennies, tuppence halfpenny, to get milk at school. You know, uh, you were you were allowed to buy the little bottles of milk each day. It was a program that they brought in while I was at school. Probably you too, you did it. <clears throat> so religiously, every Monday morning, my stepmother gave me tuppence halfpenny to get milk, and religiously every Monday lunchtime I spent it in the sweet shop. <laughs> <laughs> so 
here you see before you were a child and developed <laughs> not too much milk at least not in school. Because <clears throat> you know the thing is that, that, that you mustn't think that we're talking about centuries ago, before the flood. I mean, this was 1930, 31, 32. It's Maybe to you it feels like before the flood. years ago. Yes, yeah, of, course, yes of right. course it is. I take that back. <laughs> um, who, is, uh, who is the worst teacher, the most horrible teacher you can remember in your career, uh -huh. your school career? You have one, I know. Yes, I remember mine. A fellow called Gwilym Lloyd. He, he, was a, he was about six foot four, a geography, a geography master, and he hated me, and I hated him. <laughs> and he always called me out in lies, always called me out in lies. I don't know why I bothered to, to, to try to like him, because he always called me out. He, he, said, he said once, uh, uh, we had to write an essay on, on Japan, you know, the, the general descriptions of the country. And as it happened, my father had a Japanese catalogue book uh, related to the steamship line, uh, Maru, Maru Tibu, something like that. And there was a full-fledged description of, of Japan in this book. And I copied this down willy-nilly. <laughs> Beautiful descriptions of flowers and uh, all the foreign... I wonder wonderful, why he thought of you with a, And was alive. when he went, when we went to, 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 uh, to church school that morning, he said, um, I want Lundbeck to read out his essay to the class, and I thought, oh, well, 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 <laughs> and I came to the phrase, you, you can smell the subtle, the subtle aromas of the East, <laughs> and I said, you can smell all the subtle aromas, he said, just a minute, what was that? I said, you can read, you can smell all the subtle aromas of the East, he said, what was that word again? I said, subtle, he said, what does it mean? I said, well, Fragrances. Uh, he said, "What kind of fragrances?" <laughs> and he stared at me, and I, I, of course, I went crimson red. I knew damn well I didn't know the meaning of the word subtle. I didn't know <laughs> well, what it he meant. couldn't even pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I couldn't. Of course, I couldn't. And um, he came over to me. He said, "So we don't know what subtle means." He said, "The words are subtle and better information." And he had a red and blue crayon pencil on. And while he was talking to me, he was rubbing this pencil on my nose, <laughs> colouring it red and blue. And of course, all the kids in the class were hysterical. It looked so funny, and all the time he was saying, "You, what was the word now, Lundbeck? Was it subtle or subtle? Do you remember the word now? Where did you get this information from, Lundbeck?" Oh, so and all sick. the time he was doing this, so I went with a red and blue nose. Oh God, that's terrible. And then the, the other <clears> time was, he came and he said, "Who's taken the Who's taken the uh, last night's homework down to the?" Um, it was a sort of uh, um, room, small room there where you took the homework down for each previous night so that each master could come along and pick his own homework out, you know, and then mark it. And uh, he came and he said, somebody taken the, the homework down to the, um, down to the, um, the, I forget what he called, cubby hole or something he called it. And I said, yes, that I did. He said, fine. He said, uh, when did you take it down? I said, uh, when we came, we came into school, sir. So he sat down and he, he pestered and he said, Lundbeck, I don't see your homework here. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I was too late to hand it in. <laughs> I'd already taken that damn stuff down to the cubby hole. He said, oh, you were too late to hand it in, were you? He said, didn't you tell me that you just taken it down to the cubby hole? I said, yes, I did, sir. He said, well, well, the 100 lines, 150 lines. He didn't pass my nose black and blue, or red and blue that time, though, for a change. I loathed him, loathed that man. You had every very you good reason. Why? That God, it's horrible. Yeah. Oh, there were some horrors. You were, you had homework. I, I was lucky in that we had a headmaster who didn't believe in homework. Uh, uh, literally didn't believe in it. He said if, uh, if everybody did their work at school, there was absolutely no need for homework. Um, <clears throat> I didn't have any particularly bad teachers. I had one who was a very bad teacher, but she wasn't a particularly bad person. But we did have, <clears throat> um, in those days we learned cookery, laundry, and all that kind of thing supposed to be for the home. And <clears throat> we had a Miss Man, and she, if she got excited enough and uh, you weren't moving fast enough, she thought nothing of throwing a carrot at you. <laughs> During cooking, well, we were in cookery oh, class. Oh, you, see. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you had to be pretty nimble on your feet to dodge if she was in a bad mood. <laughs> teachers, teachers 
was in those days tended to be a little um, explosive. <laughs> 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 Apart from that, I don't remember any real horrors. Um, ones we didn't like, of course, that weren't very popular. Ones we doted on, you know. <laughs> and uh, had a great crush on Mr. Powell. He was Welsh too. He was he was our history. Swine. He was our history <laughs> master. It, we we all liked him because he said, <clears throat> "Dates are not history. You don't need to memorise dates." He said. Uh, and, um, he told you were in a progressive school, didn't you? Yes. It, well, in some ways, I started off in quite a, progress, a, pro, a okay. progressive school because my infant school was very progressive. They learned, uh, we learned the alphabet phonetically, and uh, we all sat at small individual tables, four of us around the little table, and had our own boxes with our stuff in. And uh, so it really, for those days, it was only an infant school, which was uh, five to seven or eight, I think. And then we went to the junior school, but it was very progressive. But Mr. Powell, going back to Mr. Powell, he only believed you needed to know two dates, 1066. Uh, that was Hastings. The Battle of Hastings. No, no. 1815, the repeal of the Corn Law, for some reason or another. <laughs> Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> I don't know when the Corn Law went in, but I know what? when it came out, it which was, was the, the Battle of Waterloo. Yes, I know it was, but that's the <laughs> thing. <laughs> I think perhaps it was 1812, the repeal of the Corn Law. I've probably forgotten it by now. I'm sorry, Mr. Powell. But, but, uh, <laughs> Much good history, can you? <laughs> but you know, he was, he was interesting, but he just didn't believe in dates, which of course we loved him for. He wanted to learn a lot of miserable dates. Mm. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> Well, the only other teacher I, I remember loathing with a, a hatred, and I can't remember her name, was when we were in infant school, my first school, Adamstown in Cardiff. And one of, one, of the, one of the friends that I had then said, have you ever tried riding on the back of a truck? And I said, no, he said, it's great fun. He said, next time a truck comes down, the, down here, they have to slow to turn around the corner. He said, had grab onto the back and give us a ride. It's really good. I I can't I can't have been manual about I was about five or six, I suppose. Anyway, a coal truck came down. And uh, it slowed down at the corner, sure enough, and I grabbed went on grabbed hold of it and away I went up to the, up to the uh, next street street. And I got I, I, I better let go of this thing. I mean, I don't know whether daddy he's gonna take me. I don't know whether I was gonna I was gonna wind up. Oh and I let go. And bang, I went on the on the road, of course. I puffed up, puffed up cheek, you know, and uh, stitches in my face all over. It was a terrible mess. Anyway, this was something or other, whatever her name was. When I went I went back to class three or four days later, she said, Lundbeck or Raymond, come out here to the front. And I came out to the front and she said, now I want you boys and girls to look at something. And I thought, I want to get some sympathy here. She said, this is what happens to you if you run on the back of trucks. You're going to look like him. Now don't do it. And I love that woman then. I thought, what? Sympathy? Oh, you for... turn out like this. <laughs> you forget about sympathy from school teachers. You just didn't get it. It's a miracle we survived, isn't it, really? Yeah, when toughened, you think of it. Toughened us up, I think. Who was the teacher that um, told you you'd read your name first as, and you were at the bottom of the list? You took a test and... Oh, that was that was in... Um, that was in high, my high school. Uh, Walter Ware. Walter Ware. Yeah, what was that story? Yes, uh, um, when you he taught physics. Things. He taught yeah. physics. Mm -hmm. And we had, he said, I've got the results of your exams, the Christmas exams, whatever it was. And uh, we all sat down and he said, right, now first on the list is Lundbeck. And I thought, <laughs> my God, what? He said, second on the list is uh, George Wines. And I thought, there's something wrong here. Wines, Wines is as is, is dobby as I am. <laughs> and how the devil did I manage to give first? And he said, oh, wait a minute. And he turned us around and said, right, the first on the, on the list is so and so and so and so. I was still bottom of the damn list. But he was trying to be a bit clever, pointing the, putting the list up the other way. <laughs> Teachers, horrible in our day, horrible. <laughs> they did pull some nasty tricks. They used to make you feel small. Mm. Feel um, small. Let's see, what, talk about the 
church in your family, a religion in your family, and <laughs> what you did. Well, you know, whatever it was, yeah. whatever it manifested, what, what happened, what you did with it, and... Well, mine was very little. Um, we, we had been christened and we had been baptized, and um, I had a, I had a, uh, a godmother who's um, had been okay. Okay, I, I had had a godmother who'd been my mother's friend, and uh, she came to the house <clears throat> when I was ten to see if I wanted to be confirmed, and. I must admit, I, I, I weighed up the, the prospects of getting a new dress with the prospect of having to learn all the catechism and decided against it. And this is Church my, of England? Yeah, Church of England. My father was very much of the school, if you want to go, that's fine. If you don't want to go, that is also fine. So when my friends were going to Sunday school and there was nobody about, I used to sort of go sometimes and I'd go for a few weeks. But it really, I can't ever pretend that it ever meant very much to me. And it was not pressed in my family. It was very much a thing of choice. And what about Nana? Nana, of course, uh, my stepmother was Catholic. And we used to get the visiting priests would come <clears throat> to see her when a new priest came to them. She never, she always told them right from word go that we had been born into a Church of England family and that she would in no way try to influence us into her religion and she told them that right from the beginning. She <clears throat> did used to go for a ma to Mass for a while and my <clears throat> father used to go occasionally with her especially at um, Christmas Eve because he liked the singing. Did you go there? Did you no, go to Mass? I never went to Mass with her and gradually <laughs> after I think the first year <coughs> it faded because she found the difficulty of going to Mass and then coming back and cooking a full-scale Sunday dinner was a bit too much with the, the family and gradually she just stopped going. So she when she started going when we were, and when I was alive, Nana always went to Mass on Sunday if she could, I remember. Very rarely, unless it was something special. She had stopped years before that, huh. when we were young, because she just found it too much to go. Huh. Too much. Well, my father was Lutheran, and uh, my mother was Roman Catholic. And of course, in the Roman Catholic religion, if you uh, if you marry outside the church, you have to you have to sort of vow to the priest or bishop, wherever it is, that you'll see that your children are brought up in the Catholic faith. And with this, my father did. But I remember always feeling a sense of injustice that while my mother stopped going to, to Roman Catholic Church after they were married, he insisted on the children going to church. <laughs> so he did keep up, the, keep up this, uh, this uh, thing, uh, promising the priest that uh, we'd be brought up. In. And I had to think, that, why the devil doesn't he, doesn't he go to church as well? And instead of pushing it up for Aunt Joan and myself all the time. It's probably bad to get rid of you for a couple of quiet <laughs> yeah, hours. Your mother stopped going though? Your mother didn't go to church? She stopped, no, she stopped going. <laughs> stopped going. I, we, I thought your mother was more involved than that, but you were an altar boy at one point, right? Choir boy. Qu oh, choir you, were you, went to, you went to a church school too, didn't you? St. Peter's, yes, I did, yes. yes. You went to a Catholic school? That was a Catholic school, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was... Uh... Hideous collection of boys. <laughs> <laughs> Dreadful. Why? <laughs> you didn't like the priest either. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, the, tr the, tr the trouble with this damn uh, business at school was that you had to you had to be at, at nine o'clock mass on Sunday morning. If you didn't attend, you were punished. There's no two ways about it. So you you got you got two things. You were punished by your parents for not going to to, to church, and you were punished by the damn headmaster for not going to church. And everybody watched. You know, you if you didn't turn up to first mass, well maybe something was wrong in the family. Somebody would watch to see if you went to second, because that happened in Ireland when we went or when we went with Anna and. Uh, uh, we uh, used to uh, go to Mass because it was easier than her explaining she was married to a non-Catholic <laughs> into a non-Catholic family in Ireland so we just all went to Mass. My stepmother said, that's all right. I was about 12 then. She said, that's all right. Just stand when everybody else stands and kneel when everybody else kneels and just keep your head down. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm afraid it was, yeah. Think about the Empire. <laughs> yeah. Right. One thing that seems, I don't know, it seems like I hear this a lot, is that when you were growing up, um, 
kind of what you're just saying right now, that the neighbors were very much involved in people's business. Like you went out the door, uh, yes. the neighbors were reporting to your mother what you did. and So can you, th I guess I was just going to ask you anyway, what, what kind of, did you have eccentric neighbors or funny neighbors or were you close to your, what was your relationship with neighbors? I mean, I know Daddy, you live in a lot of different places, but I guess ones that stand out for you. Or either one of you, you know. For me, well, me, I had lived in the same place in London uh, uh, until I was married, but I was born there and uh, lived there always. Um, they were apartments, but just up and down, like more like what you call maisonettes. Were you born at home? Yes. And the people that lived next door had known my mother, which was, funnily enough, a thing I hadn't realised until I was about ten. And... Uh, I was speaking to the lady next door one day, Mrs. Tabard, and uh, she said something about, oh, your mother then. And I said, well, did you know her? And she said, good gracious, my girl, of course I knew her. She said, I, I lived here for years knowing her. And I remember saying to her, what was she like? I had a picture of her on my wall, and, but I had never really sort of thought of her as a person. You know, it was difficult. I was two when she died. And she looked at me and she said, oh, what was she like? It's difficult to say. And then she said, I'll tell you one thing. She said, if there were two or three of us talking and talking at the gate and your mother came along, she turned it into a party. And I always remembered that about her and it was very enlightening for me to be told that by an outsider because she had, she did suffer from ill health, she had, um, she suffered all her life with asthma, in fact she died of complications of asthma mm -hmm. and so, and she was still a young woman really, you know, and uh, so that was a sort of great enlightenment for me. Mm. Well, yeah, we moved a lot moved around a lot when I was younger, different places, different houses, and we always seemed to, seemed to get a lot of, lot of peculiar neighbours, <laughs> very peculiar. I remember one, one family we had next to us in Newport Road, the fellow was a, a chapel goer, a, a vicious chapel goer. <laughs> he, I mean, there's nothing worse, than, nothing worse than a Welsh vicious chapel goer. And he used to, he used to go to his chapel in the evenings, come out of there, go to the pub, get blind drunk, then come home and play hymns on, on his uh, harmonium <laughs> and sing, sing hymns at the top of his voice. And then they used to throw Christmas pudding over the garden wall. <laughs> I don't know why they did that. They thought we were starving or something. <laughs> yes, throw Christmas puddings. You mean every year? I just <laughs> well, it doesn't matter if had it. You just use up our garden as a, as a sort of dumping ground. Well, they hadn't used up, they threw over. See, we never, we never moved for the simple reason that my father hated moving because he'd been moved so many times when he was a child. He said he used to go home from school and his mother had got the house packed up. I mean, not a word was said in the morning. And they'd go home and she'd say, oh, or she'd say to them sometimes, Oh, when you come out of school, go to this address. And then, of course, it, those days it was, a, it was a horse and cart, and she'd have all the stuff on the horse and cart, and then they'd be in a new house. He said, they moved every, at least every once a year, moment. I think, every few months she'd pack up the house. You imagine they'd come <laughs> home to this address. <laughs> never, never, never a dull moment. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I only remember her in one address, but she, of course, the family were all grown then, and she lived in a little house. And that was uh, where we used to go over for <coughs> Sunday evening tea. And uh, she was at the same house in Henry Road there. We used to have uh, a real London Cockney tea, which is winkles and shrimps and watercress and bread and butter and cake, of course. Was she a Cockney? Was. Oh, yes. Uh, my father, my father was really born a Cockney. He was born to be a Cockney you were supposed to be within the sound of Bow Bells and he certainly was because he was born in Bow. He was born in the church and uh, yes they, they were really true Cockneys I mean <clears throat> not the, the Cockneys that carry on the tradition like the Pearlies the Pearly que Kings and Queens I mean that's a different thing because they are that is handed down in families as a you become an heir to a, to a, a pearly king's 
kingdom, if you want to call it, you know. But no, that, but he was definitely, uh, we were definitely from the East End of London and they were Cockneys. Yeah. So what are, um, what are some stories, or what, think of a story for each of your parents that you can, you, I mean, what's a story you can think of that sticks out in your mind that your father or mother told you about there? I mean, that's one that granddad told you. So say for Nana that she told you about her childhood or your mother oh, told her, you know, like in Denmark or my Ireland. stepmother of course grew up in in Ireland and her <clears throat> mother had died giving birth to her actually and her father had other children and um, she was taken by her grandparents so she was raised really as an only child and, and made much of she had quite a good life in many ways but her grandfather was a, a country fiddler and he used to play at all the the uh, big country fairs and the barn dances and all that sort of thing. And he also used to teach fiddling. In fact, he invented a chair to make people curve their arm. They had to put it through the side of the chair so that they had to curve their bow arm because, you know, he was teaching farm boys for the most part who used to saw away. <laughs> and in fact, when I went back to Ireland mm -hmm. and I went to a party and I was singing some old songs and this old lady said to me, how do you know all these songs? And I said, well, my grandmother was from here and she asked me her name, she said, Anna Nolan. And she said, was she one of the fiddling Nolans? Oh, well, I didn't... And that was right in uh, Ockram. In Ockram. Which was, she was, you know, right, her grandfather was from there. Or well, right? no, he, he lived over in Tally Ho, but they would have probably known they went him because they I remember moved going to Ockram with Nana when we went over there. Yes, and she they said, had went, there. they so had she gone said, around. Fiddling, one of the fiddling Nolans. Uh, I didn't know anybody else in the family. That's news to me, you see, because that's <coughs> something I learned. But the thing is that <clears throat> he used to come home with a, a bunch of friends quite late at night. My stepmother would be in bed. She was a little girl. And uh, she would, he, uh, they would come home and then, of course, they would have a few drinks, you know. And uh, he'd get out his fiddle and start to play. And the next thing he knew, he'd come up and get my stepmother down, bring her down in her nightdress and her boots, put her boots on, and put her on the kitchen table. And she used to do step dancing while they fiddled. <laughs> so, many a morning she didn't go to school because she'd been up half the night dancing. And of course, sometimes she didn't go to school because they were up sitting with a sick animal. I mean, the animals, the farm was all they had. It was very important. Education came second because the animals were so precious that the children would be set to sit with them while the men were out in the fields, you know, so they didn't go to school that day, that's all it was. So that's why I think she was very, very anxious for us never to miss a day. We never missed a day at school. She was always most anxious for us to keep up our attendance and go. And I, can't, I, can't, I can't think of anything that my father said about my mother, my mother uh, about my father, no, no, no sort of anecdote. The one, the one uh, gem of purest Ray Serene in my family is my Uncle Jack. A real, a real gem. It was Uncle Jack who went to an old, old, old folks' home, and at 93 he was asked by the matron to leave because he went to the pub across the road and came back at 93 and, and was singing songs at all hours of the night, disturbing all the other patients. <laughs> so the matron said, you have to leave because we can't put up with this any longer. Is that enough? <laughs> no, no, I remember you telling, like, you're telling, um, I, don't, I don't remember you ever talking about your a story from your mother's past, but I remember like you were talking about, um, you know, the movies in Denmark, when your father went to the movies, the silent movies. Do you remember oh, that? well, that's just one thing that I remember him telling me that, he, he, he mentioned that uh, the first time they had, they had moving pictures in his village uh, and there was one scene there where a fellow was supposed to chop off the head of another man, another man on the block and there was a man behind the screen who had a large cabbage there <laughs> and just the moment when he saw this acid and he, he put the, <laughs> the, the, the axe straight through the cabbage it was pandemonium. The women screaming, <laughs> fainting all over the place. <laughs> terrible thing. Terrible. <laughs> Sound that, effects. That really was. That really was the early days. Then <laughs> um, you don't remember anything from your mother. What was your? <clears throat> your no, mother no. was a maid, right? Or did she? What did she do? A waitress. She was a waitress. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, and Auntie Lena was her sister. It was her sister. Yeah. Now, what did they grow up in Ireland? Or where? No, no, no. In Cardiff. In, in Cardiff. Cardiff. The first, the first one to get to, to get to Cardiff from Ireland was my 
grandfather. Her father? Your mother's father? Uh, yes, right. Who came, who landed, who landed in Newport, which is about 12 miles from Cardiff, with a, they, they always told me, with a, with a belt full of gold sovereigns. Oh, yeah. And um, he used to say, Look at look at this when he was 90, 90 yards or something. Look at this skin, that the whitest skin in Europe. Put his, put his shirt back there. He's, in, he's, in, he's in skin like a baby, like a baby. Never 93. Saw the sun. <laughs> and uh, he was apparently he was three days dying. They said his heart wouldn't give out. Mm. Wouldn't give out. Mm. We both come from fairly long-lived people. Then your grand, well, your I know your father wasn't. Your father died, but your grandfather was very long-lived. And what? my father was very long-lived. Died at 91. And, uh, That's because he never did anything. <laughs> he worked hard all his life. He was a trimmer. <laughs> since he was since he retired. Oh, I mean, not he since retired. he retired. And like well, you. That's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, that's what I'm, I'm emulating his late life. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's what I'm doing. That's the pot calling the kettle black if ever I heard it. <laughs> well, if nominated, I will not run. <clears throat> and if elected, I will not serve. <laughs> that should do it. Don't you think for the time being? Do you want to take a break now? Yes, a, a break. I thought it was finished. <laughs> I've got a lot more to go. Oh, let's take a break. Let's okay, take a break. I've got eight minutes on left on the tape. So okay, we've eight minutes. You oh, eight that. minutes. You may as well let him finish the tape. Yes. <sighs> All right. All right, go on. Can I ask another question then? Okay, I was going to ask, um, what, what is, what's your memory surrounding your father dying and your mother dying? I mean, I know he was really young, but what are the memories that you have around that time? What, what was... Well, I have no memory of my mother dying. I was two. And literally, I remember nothing about it, nothing about it at all. I remember uh, when I can remember my aunt coming to live with us for the uh, for the year. The first year, as I say, my, my, my father's sister came to live with us for a year. He didn't want us to be split up. He wanted to keep us as a family. And um, because our, our godmothers would have had us separately, but he wanted to keep us together as a family. So his, his sister, who was unmarried, came to live with us for a year. And then my stepmother, who had been engaged to his brother, the second, the second brother, my father was the eldest, she had been engaged to him and he had been killed in World War I. And um, she remained friendly with, as it happened, this unmarried aunt. She was now living in England, working. She was a housekeeper and she was living in England and she had remained friendly with the family. And when my mother died, um, she, I guess she and my father made a marriage of convenience. It kept us together as a family. It gave her her own home and it worked out very well. And I do vaguely remember going in the car to their wedding. Uh, they were they they were married outside London, so it was a long drive. And my my brother marked the occasion by falling backwards out of the car through the car door, landing in the street, <laughs> which was always remembered. And uh, but I, it's very vague. I, I, I have dim memories and. Uh, of be you know just going to this this happening i knew it was something special and it was as i look back i'm told it was their wedding and what do you well know? i don't i don't you were remember. older when you were yes i was um, it's that 1935 so i was 14. um he'd gone to, he'd gone to hospital he strained his heart and I learned afterwards that, he, that he'd, had a, he'd had rheumatic fever when he was a young man, and that left his heart in a very weakened condition. And apparently he'd been trying to move a, a large sideboard or something at work, and he collapsed. And they rushed him off to hospital, and uh, I, I don't know much about this at the time. We had a cousin staying with us, and she phoned the hospital up every day and I just, I just remember that she came out of the telephone box, the telephone booth, and said, her eyes were, she was, her eyes were filled with tears, and she said, uh, he, he, died, uh, he died at half past one. And I can just remember then the people coming to the house and a dreadful smell of flowers, horrible smell of flowers, I can always remember that. Ghastly smell, 
always associate certain flowers with that with that experience. Yes, because people were always laid out at home in those days. You visited the, the home and the person was laid out in the best room, banked with flowers, you know, and you were supposed to go in and say goodbye. I never went to a funeral. In my, in my family, kids weren't, weren't, weren't were never encouraged. I didn't go to a funeral in fact until I came to this country. So did they put? Did they do the same things they did in Wales? They would lay people out in the room when you were growing yes. up. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, a couple. No, I know they did that for you. I'm saying in London, did they do that too? Oh yes, yes, indeed, yes. You were laid out either on trestle. The coffin was laid out uh, <clears throat> on the on the trestle. Were and you allowed the, to visit your father in hospital? Or did they let kids yeah, visit? Yes, you. Yes, you were. Well, as far as I know you were, but I, I didn't go for some reason I don't think they always now allowed children, Joe, right? If he was in intensive days. care or the kind of equivalent of intensive care, maybe they wouldn't let you... But yeah. you had huge wards then with about 20 people in. There were no private yeah. rooms. You were a long row of beds. But I don't think they allowed children in hospitals. Yeah, I've got a feeling I remember reading that they didn't. Yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure they didn't. And, and it, it sort of wasn't encouraged, mostly just the mother or, went, or the wife went, you know. So, well, my father, my father, it was sad when my mother died because she had had, she got pneumonia as a complication from very bad asthma attack. She had suffered from asthma all her life and there was nothing but an inhalant in those days, potter's pills, they used to burn them. And, and, and uh, he, he went to, uh, he used to go and see her at this hospital on his way to work. And he went in one morning and saw a little nurse there and said to her, I've come to see Mrs. Gregory. And she looked at him in panic and said, well, excuse me, excuse me, I'm going to get the matron. And uh, the matron came in and said, didn't the police come down? And they were supposed to notify him and she had died already on her own, which was must have been a terrible shock. He just walked in and discovered that, you know, he, he was... His wife, young wife, had died and he was left with three children and no one had sort of notified him. It was rather yeah. appalling. Mm. That's true. I was only about two minutes left on this tape, so I should wrap it up. Okay, um, I would, I guess, I, I, mean, I have a lot more to <laughs> so only scratch the surface. But Put him down on a street of paper. Mm. Okay, you know, you know what I was going to say is just, um, why don't you just finish by, I was going to go a lot more into kind of later life, because this is all early life, but why don't you just finish by talking about the night you met Oh, yes, I well remember that. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh yes, I remember too. Uh, yes, I remember. Well, we had a, I worked in a government office in, uh, in London, and uh, among, among our uh, customers was a, a firm, was it Norton? No, Norton? Norton? No, I don't I, remember Norton. No, I well, just, I, uh, well, anyway, the, one, of, one of my colleagues there, an old man who was 40, uh, uh, had been in touch with with, uh, with, uh, with with Hazel's firm and we were having a dance, a dinner and dance at uh, the local pub and he invited her across and I was standing there at the bar having a drink and she came through the door. I'd never seen him of course I was looking for him just by name I had never met this man I had spoken to him I spoke to them all on the phone the whole branch because I, I was in wages and I used to have to call about taxes. And I remember she came to the door and she she smiled as she came through and I said my god who is that radiant creature? Screamed out at the top of his lungs I mean I felt a perfect fool there was about six or seven men in this little tiny snuggery right behind the bar and I walked in and said Said, is I can't remember his Jimmy name. Jimmy Bowler. J Jimmy Bowler. Oh God, yes, Jimmy Bowler. Is there a Jimmy Bowler in here? <laughs> and this idiot shouts out, "Who is this ravishing woman?" And I have <laughs> sunk into the ground. <laughs> However, Jimmy Bowler <clears throat> spent the whole evening buying me drinks, and every time he went up to the bar to drinks, your father was making time. So. <laughs> <laughs> So in the end... I think it'll last, don't you? A few days... <laughs> a few days after he called me up at work and he said, uh, do you remember me? He said, that, um, we, we met at the, at the uh, party. So I said, yes, I remember. So he said, 
Um, he said, I'd had a few drinks. I said, yes, I had reckoned on that. And he said, but I would like to see you again. And, and uh, we'd had a lot of fun talking and laughing because we sort of clicked right from the beginning. And <clears throat> he said, the only thing is, he said, uh, we'll have to put it off for a while because I'm dead broke. <laughs> and I mean, it's gone like uh, ever since. So, <laughs> we started off as we went on. <laughs> I'll forgive you that remark. <laughs> That's that. Great. Thank you very much. That was great. Very good. That wasn't too bad.